crowded motorway at night. Traffic on opposite carriageways passing each other at a combined speed of 140 miles an hour. Separating them, a crash barrier. A crash barrier saved my life. Um, I was involved in a pileup. Um, as, I, uh, as I hit the car in front of me, I careered off towards the other side of the road. The traffic on that side was coming towards me at 70 miles an hour. Luckily for me, the, uh, the barrier was there, pushed me back onto the same side of my road. So um, I, I was you know, safe. I uh, would have been dead otherwise. Britain now has the best crash barriers in the world. It's taken 40 years of hard work and an awful lot of wrecks to get to this position. But this tough testing by engineers has really paid off. So how did they do it? Britain's first motorways were an entirely new system. They carried high-speed, high-volume traffic, but there weren't any crash barriers. The head-on crashes that followed were horrific, so the Department of Transport began testing barriers. They tried hedges and shrubs, too soft. They tried wire fences, but these caught on the bumpers of cars and lorries and dragged them over. They tried cables, but these didn't stop lorries and even some cars ploughing right through them. Then they tried metal barriers, and these worked, which is why you'll see them on every motorway today. But no one in the road safety business is ever completely satisfied. And it's the job of two guys from the Highways Agency to make sure we get even better barriers. Meet Brian and Alan. They know exactly what a crash barrier must do. Some people think that crash barriers, you just crash into them and they stop you and that's it. But it's not quite that simple. We have to try and ensure that they stop you in a controlled manner so you don't hurt yourself and neither do you bounce back out into traffic and you're not a hazard to other road users. And a modern British crash barrier does all that. Huh. The barrier works like a giant elastic band. It's not rigid, it gives enough to cushion the impact, but it's strong enough not to break. That's all right for most sections of motorway, but in some places you can't use barriers that bend. On bridges, for example, there isn't enough room. Even so, Brian and Alan make sure we're safe because they know how to use concrete. Tests on early concrete barriers were fine at slow speeds, but the barriers were low and at high speeds, the cars were thrown up and over. So they made the barriers much higher, copying American designs. But these had a lip or step at the bottom, which simply acted like a takeoff ramp for the smaller British car. Many fractured minis later, they got the height right, but you had to be careful which side of the car you sat in. Eventually, it evolved to this. The lip lowered to exactly the right height for British cars. But for a long time, temporary crash barriers continued to be a problem. Then Brian and Alan came up with a solution. The proof came one night in September 1996. A tanker full of liquid nitrogen went out of control on the M25. Traffic was heavy. There were roadworks, but Alan and Brian's temporary barrier held and stopped the lorry crossing over into the oncoming traffic. If those barriers hadn't have been there, it would have gone onto the three lanes on the other carriageway, which would have been devastated. There would have been many lives lost, plus all the workers that were working with me as well. We'd have all been gone. It seemed like a miracle no one was killed. In fact, it was down to Alan and Brian's latest concrete masterpiece, a temporary barrier that can be quickly built and dismantled, but has all the strength of a permanent one. And the secret behind it is these separate blocks. They're bolted together and have special joints that lock an impact, so they form one long barrier if anything crashes into them. Brian, Alan and their team test the system again and again until they know they've got it right. You have to be crash happy in this game. We've tried developing these things on paper, which is how normal engineering works, and we've uh, found that that doesn't work. So it's back to the test track. Here's a brand new crash barrier, and this lucky lorry is going to smash into it. What the team are especially looking for is how far the lorry bounces back from the wall and how far the barrier itself moves. So they mark out the area with a set of yellow lines. 
Then they set up a whole range of cameras and speed sensors to monitor the smash from every angle. It'll be the lorry's last ride, and they'll make sure they get the most out of it. Who's driving the lorry? No one. It's drained of fuel and connected to a winch, which pulls it along at 40 miles an hour. Goodbye, old truck, but at least you're going in a good cause. And here she goes. For the lorry, it's the end of the road. For Brian, Allen and the team, it's the beginning of a painstaking check of every detail of the smash. The lorry turned over it shouldn't have. They'll sort that out. But despite the huge impact, there's very little damage to the barrier. And it moved well within the limit they'd set, just 22 centimetres. Anyone driving on the opposite carriageway would have been perfectly safe. 20 millimetres, which is a lot less than we expected it to move. The main satisfaction is when you see pressure reports of lorries being contained by the new concrete barriers. It uh, shows that what we're doing isn't all a waste of time. What I'd like to say to this chap who invented these barriers, I think, well, I'd like to go and buy the guy a pint. I think he's brilliant. It really is. Well, we'll take off his <laughs> offer. <laughs> it's a crash course that never ends, because Brian and Alan want to make sure our worst motor nightmare can never come true.